Okay, Shinya Hashimoto. You know, he died when he was 40. He was just 40. Jesus. Um, uh, he never really like when he started out as a rookie. He kind of looked like he's always kind of looked like he does. <laughs> he's always been a big boy, uh, and he was unique when he was uh, when New Japan did. They would do like recruiting tours where they go to cities and see if there are any athletes or wrestlers who might be interested in uh, signing up for the dojo, right? And they found him. He's from Gifu. It's kind of a rural area, really country. You know. It's, not very exciting area, you know. Beautiful, looks beautiful. I think skiing, maybe. I don't know, but it's just, you know, it's it's the countryside. They found him. He had a background in uh, judo and uh, karate, and that really helped kind of legitimize him coming into New Japan because that was '87. Like that was really like prime time UWF, and that Japanese wrestling was changing quite a bit right at that time. So. Having that martial arts background really drove his career, or uh, kind of drove what he became, and it was pretty fast. He, I remember, he got a big upset victory over Ricky Choshu. Oh yeah, that's right. We forgot to mention Ricky Choshu showed up last night at Wrestle yeah. Kingdom <laughs> with his crying grandson. Kid was right. miserable. <laughs> uh, poor, little, poor little guy. But I was, uh, I was when I saw Ricky Choshu, Justin. I thought. All right, I wonder what Justin's thinking right now. Seeing his, I heard the favorite. music, my fucking heart dropped. <laughs> I was like, "Did you?" I, did you I, I heard wife? it. What'd you do? Did you tell her? No, no, she was out. Oh, okay, it, she was out. Um, she knew, like, she knows what I'm doing. She was like, "I'm going to bed." You tell me tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was a cute little opening, but um, I, I thought, like, wait, he's not gonna be. I don't know. I didn't know what I thought, but then I saw him come out in tuxedo and he's really popular right now. Like just in general, as a kind of a meme online, he's doing TikTok, silly TikToks and all that. So Ricky Choshu's doing TikToks. Oh my God. So he, there's the Choshu, oh uh, a media <laughs> social, he had a social media revolution. He, um, la okay. So we'll do another sidebar. We'll do Ricky Choshu sidebar this time, but a year or two ago, but this is good. A year or two ago, um, he, Ricky Choshu got onto Twitter. And Twitter is, I think, maybe the number one social media app in Japan for, like, as people don't really use Facebook. As, I, it's Twitter and Instagram. Pictures are Instagram and text is for Twitter, right? So he got on Twitter finally. It was a big deal. And his first tweet was actually, he, he didn't really know what, Twitter was so his first tweet said something like a uh, uh, Masao I got it or oh, Masao he's talking about Tiger Hattori the referee <laughs> anyway, he thought he was messaging Tiger Hattori but that was actually his first public tweet that's so old man stuff that's phenomenal and that really it exploded in um, in Japan online at, as just kind of like a, I mean, he was a really big he was cultural mover and, and shaker and serious uh, draw from all throughout the eighties into probably up to like 96, 98. Uh, so he's like, you know, cultural icon to an extent. And it was hilarious to most people. So he has, now he's just taken over social media, his tweets. Um, I suggest if you can find Ricky Choshu on Twitter. Oh, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. It, some of the stuff that he says, it's just, it's great. It's feel good. Uh, it, it's very much Choshu and it's cool that Twitter has decently accurate translations so you can follow along and know what's going on. But yeah, it was nice to see Choshu. I hope they use him more going forward if they can. Uh, but that's just me personally. I don't know how, uh, how much appeal he has to, audience outside of japan right now but hey so that's that's and then he just turned into yeah social media cowboy so that that's ricky choshu that's why he's so popular and that's why he showed up on last night's show so sorry i forgot to mention that so let's tie him back to shin hashimoto okay shin hashimoto got a upset victory on choshu at tokyo dome i think it was 1990 it was like five minutes right he he just rolled them up out of nowhere and it was in that tournament where Hashimoto got through Choshu, who was, I think he was booking by this time, or he started to book. 
So he kind of took himself out of the picture, kind of launched Hashimoto, kind of like uh, rocket launched him from, he was still kind of a young lion, only a couple of years in, to, wow, this guy beat Choshu. And later on in the night, he rested. This was on the one of the early Tokyo Dome shows. At, he wrestled Vader later on that night in the main loss, but I think he really got over from then. Uh, he also wrestled on the first Tokyo Dome show, right? Against Victor Zangief, the inspiration yeah. for Zangief. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Street Fighter 2. He was it's a, it's a good match too. It's kind of short, but it was a cool shoot style kind of it was definitely of the time, but looking back on it now, like JD, I'd like your thoughts on this one if you ever check it out, but it's uh, uh Zangief is pretty good. Like, yeah, pretty from interesting. I, from what I've gathered about Zangief is he's better than he had any real right to be because pro wrestling in, in Russia is not a thing. So a lot of times they'll try to get those guys doing it and they just don't, it doesn't quite click. So well, I'm, I'm interested. Well, yeah. What he did, he just kind of, he wrestled like probably as you would because that was the style. And now we can look at it with 2021 20, eyes and go, oh, we understand what the techniques he's using. He's he's just wrestling and, and Hashimoto was kind of, kind of going against that wrestling with his own martial arts. So that was kind of the styles clash that was the appeal. Right. So he, his selling was kind of goofy, but hey, it was, I think, his first match ever he in got, front of a lot of people. Yeah, but, Victor Zangi got it better, but he was the most natural of the Russians. And he right. really got it going in UWFI, too. If you see his, look up his UWFI matches, he's really, really good. He, I mean, Sam Hashminikov, right? He was the one that won the IWGB yep. title. He was the one they were really featuring, and, um, which I liked him, but. Zang Victor Zangi was, you know, maybe he could, maybe because he didn't have the, the look, he had the bald head, the, the side, the hair, old man teacher haircut, I call it, um, bald head, and um, uh, you know, he, and also the big hairy back, so maybe it wasn't like as appealing as you know Hashminikov, but um, but he's 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 solid, man. I mean, he's he was really good. So that was early on Hashimoto's career, so he's a part of that. So I guess you know. Uh, six degrees oh. of Kevin Bacon, Hashimoto somehow is involved in Street Fighter Two. Can we? We can. We can uh, BS that, right? Mm -hmm. Nah. Okay. So, uh, he oh, wow. from next ninety four, he had some big matches. Hase, uh, good, really good match with Tenyu, who was uh, in WAR. It was like the New Japan WAR kind of rivalry. That was ninety three, ninety four. Explosive, great, but he really, I think, we talked about it on one of our last shows, uh, his match with Takara and UWFI in April 96 when he won. And when he won that, it, it was a really big match. I don't think it was as big as the Takara-Muto matches from the months before, but it was a really big match, huge match, and turning point in his career because he held on to the title for almost 500 days from that. And he's also the the fellow who we associate with. You guys remember when IWGP belt kind of looked like a crown? Oh, shaped yeah. Like, yeah. That's like, that's the Hashimoto belt. That's when they changed it over. It's kind of like, you know, a Stone Cold had his own style of belt. John Cena had his belt. The, the crown is the Hashimoto belt. And when he died, they I think that's when they retired it around that time. So I, I prefer the round circle belt. Myself, it's just ah, uh, me too. The classic, yeah. uh, the uh, the aesthetic, the look of it is wasn't really my thing, but um, it, it's I guess more now like a sentimental kind of look at New Japan in the nineties, right? And by this point, he was one of the top stars in the company. He was the, the three Musketeers were in full effect. They what they agreed to, you know, kind of relaunch and 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 change the company. So they say when they were all working in Puerto Rico together, and <laughs> each three of those guys, you know, they, they dominated New Japan and wrestling popularity in the nineties. Um, Tenyu went on, or excuse me, not Tenyu, um, Hashimoto went on to. So okay, after the title, he dropped the title, but after the he lost the title, the Naoya Ogawa thing happened. So this, at first, it launched him, right? The the Naya Ogawa match. So, if you are you guys familiar with uh, the story a little oh, yeah. bit, where it was supposed to be Hashimoto versus Ken Shamrock, 
at the yes. Tokyo Dome. But it it was all scheduled to go. Ogawa was going to be on the card anyway, but it was supposed to be on the undercard. And that whole deal fell apart because Shamrock signed a WWF and he went there. So that was pretty simple, but that's what happened. So Shamrock went on and did his thing, but New Japan was kind of, they were in a, a jam because it was pretty close to Tokyo Dome show. And what happened was they just used Ogawa, who was a silver medalist judo player. He's a big deal. And the Olympics hold a lot more weight in Japan than they do here. I think if even like, so if the Olympics are so big, it's like some of the sports that we don't think that are that popular, not just judo, but like badminton or, uh, volleyball because Japan has pretty strong teams and that those become more popular. So him being a silver medal judo player in Japan is a big deal. So he, ha he has some clout already. He gets moved into the main event and it goes over like gangbusters. People are going crazy because it was sold like it was real. It was sold like uh, there was some popped uh, like kind of potato shots and early on in their match in 97, uh, Ogawa broke his nose. Uh, he broke Hashimoto's nose early on. There was some blood. Uh, people were going crazy because they thought this judo player really is angry with Hashimoto and they, they sold it like, I mean, it was pretty amazing. It was a, it was a high point. It was a zenith of this whole, uh, of the successful times of New Japan in the 90s. And they had something really special. It, it launched Ogawa into kind of this different stratus of celebrity that he, he went from athlete to to entertainer or talent. Um, and he became Inoki's guy, which is symbolic because it's also what kind of led to the downfall, beginning of the downfall for New Japan. So uh, have you guys watched the Ogawa matches or any of the, are you familiar with the, the angles and yeah. everything? Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember, yeah. So give me your thoughts on that. Uh, JD, what, do you, what were your thoughts when you saw these Ogawa Hashimoto matches? Well, at the moment, I'm actually watching Victor Zangief and, and uh, Shinya Hashimoto, and I just I love Victor Zangief. Um, this good. is this is we'll not my guy. Um, <laughs> yes, at some point, uh, you know, it was good. I, I think that Ogawa transitions to to wrestling pretty well from being a, from a judo background. I mean, it I think it helps that a lot of the the New Japan guys do come from judo backgrounds. So the transition is is a lot slick is a lot easier. I think when you got guys who kind of know your world and know your language. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a huge Agawa fan from just the match standpoint, but they're, they're fine. Like I said, I just, this, I'm actually just watched it for the first time last or last week after we talked. So it's cool. Yeah. So everyone knows I, in Japan, judo is kind of treated like, I guess how like amateur wrestling is in, in the States. It's like, probably, it's, it's bigger or like it's, it's a high school level thing. So it's compared to say here. In Japan, it's everybody's at least kind of familiar with judo just from like PE class. You know what I mean? It's it, sometimes we grow up playing baseball and basketball and football. We're we're naturally we know the rules. We know how it goes. We're kind of like inclined to just kind of get it. That is definitely a big part of judo and judo culture in Japan. So he has that going into it already. So it's like it's hard to explain, but it's one of those things that expedited his explosion in popularity. I mean, he, and he's just a big personality. He's like kind of a Japanese Goldberg in a lot of ways. Um, that's, an that's a good comparison. Side note, the U S has never had a judo medalist in the Olympics. Yeah. Only silver medalist, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. we've ever had a, I don't think we've had a male medalist. I think Kayla Harrison's the only one from the U S who's ever won a judo medal. No, there it's was a, a fellow from uh, where I grew up uh, a little outside in Iskuna. Oh, I forget his name. Jordan something I forgot he has he has a, a dojo near where I used to live in New York but and it, maybe I don't know but judo is a big deal that's yeah. my that's my point yeah and he actually went on to do some stuff with Goldberg in Hustle later we'll, we'll get to that in a second but okay so the Ogawa stuff oh and John what, what, what was your take on this like the initial match but then you were you were you remember what was kind of going on in 98, 99 when everything started to fall apart, right? So kind of walk us through that or like what were you thinking and what are your feelings on this one? How, I'll just keep it really short. When I think about Shinya Hashimoto and Ogawa, 
series, I just think about heartbreak because it was what came out of it was just not the end of Hashimoto, but just the end of Hashimoto in New Japan, really. And and really was symbolic. And he's symbolic you know, of that, yeah. That run as champion was so legendary. You know, like you said five hundred days, five hundred plus days. And I think it was four eighty nine. Inoki turn his back on, you know, it's Inoki, but you know, I just, I just thought they did Hashimoto dirty, and it just always, I always, uh, you know, because he's one of my favorites, and I just, I, 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 I don't even like, you know, even like going back to watch those matches, honestly, just because, in the end, it's just like I said, it's just heartbreak for me. It, so it was Inoki's, Inoki every couple of years had like a new protege, and like Takata was one of them, and. This time it was Ogawa, right? And he, you know, he was so, I don't understand completely why, but he was so obsessed with realism. And, and he, he was in charge and he put these guys, he was putting these guys into not shoot, in shoot fights and not work fights. The guys that really get knocked out by Krokop, you know? Like, yeah. He only had six days to train for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it was also a different time because we didn't know what, I don't even think MMA was a common word yet. It was still NHB or, or mm -hmm, like mixed part. fighting or I don't know. It was still kind of, everyone was kind of untested or it was still mysterious. I don't know. And you could still sell BS too. You could still sell that a wrestler is a legit fighter if he looks good in a pro wrestling match, right? Mm -hmm. But he, I mean, imagine if you take like Steve Austin and then he loses his title and then you put him in a UFC match with like Tank Abbott and he just gets murdered in two seconds. Oh, CM Punk? Well, um, imagine, okay, yeah, imagine, imagine CM Punk did that while, like in 2011, mm -hmm. like the night after the John Cena match at SummerSlam. That's kind of how it went from like a, he was at a peak, maybe arguably the top star in New Japan, you could say, from maybe definitely mid 90s, like 95, 97. He headlined a lot of, events that had more than 50,000 people at them. Mm -hmm. Like not many people have done that. And I don't think they'll ever do it again. He did that and it just fell apart because, well, okay. So what happened was short stories that Hashimoto said he's going to have, this was like, I think their third match at, so Ogawa won the first match. It was like an upset Hashimoto would get, they were trying to make it so that Hashimoto would get his third win back and they would, kind of round out the program but what happened was late before the event the tokyo dome event you know he changed his mind and wanted ogawa to go over but the problem was hashimoto publicly agreed to retire if he lost mm -hmm. so that wasn't really factored in on inoki's part so he had to retire and that kind of stuff is very very uh unsavory or distasteful it's kind of like false advertising, right? I mean, that's why people started to, they turned on Onita is because he would use his retirement as a way to kind of bring people to more shows on a tour. And then he would kind of say, well, I'm not really retiring because I'm actually going to come back and, you know, um, I'm not wrestling. I'm just in the ring uh, as like a mentor or some BS. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's how it was kind of viewed like, Oh God, he lost and he retired. And now like, he's just, that's it and it killed Hashimoto's momentum and everything really started to change from there and it, it what really stinks is that after Ogawa went on with you know he did, they did this thing UFO do you guys remember UFO yep mm -hmm. it was kind of a short-lived uh, shoot fight style company but by the early 2000s Ogawa just left he left everyone high and dry he left wrestling I mean, he went he did the hustle stuff but he split from Inoki, so I don't. So I don't know. It, it definitely deserves more, you know, study. I want to know more. I, I don't really completely understand what happened, but this is really the turning point in Japanese wrestling, especially New Japan. And Hashimoto later had a falling out with Choshu, who was the booker at the time. He was fired, and by this time we're in the 2000, like 2000, 2001, and the landscape both in America. It was completely different in Japan. It was changing too because Baba had died, and we we got Noah. So 
things were changing really quickly and kind of drastically. And Hashimoto was a part of that. And because he was fired, he ended up, they were going to, he wanted to do like a, an angle where he would start his own company, New Japan, New Japan Zero One. Uh, when, when he got fired, he just, he got money to back a company called Zero One. And that was his company. And he was the star of it. And he really, it was his company. It wasn't like uh Noah was a, a filled out solid company and they're still around, you know, they had, it's, they did it right. They established themselves. They had a foundation roster and th they did it right. Whereas, um, uh, what was it? Zero one. Zero. zero yeah. Zero one. It's Hashimoto. It's like Chris Jericho starting his own promotion with, um, I don't know, like imagine if he, went to a smaller promotion and just we all knew we're watching for Jericho and a bunch of people we don't know. That's kind of how it felt at first or maybe later on when he started losing popularity, he started going into debt from the money he was using to, you know, put up the company for so long. And then I'm skipping over a lot of things, but you know, suddenly 2004, 2005, excuse me, he had a brain aneurysm and he passed away. 40 years old. It's terrible. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was, it's, it was sad. It was just, I remember just being completely shocked when I found out he passed away. I remember, I think he suffered a shoulder injury, but since he was the drawing card of zero one, like he, he didn't get a surgery. So really, he had a really messed up shoulder for the you know, rest of his career just because he couldn't be off those cards. He had to wrestle to, 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 you know, because he was the guy there, obviously. Yeah, he never stopped. And uh, might I don't know if it, you know, uh, added to the stress and the hemorrhage that he had. Who knows? But yeah, the shoulder injury really started to change the trajectory of his career. He had some cool crossover matches, I remember. Uh, Kawada, um, Misawa would pop in. He was, you know, he was one of those guys. He, his name wasn't really tarnished. He was, he definitely wasn't as popular as he was in the nineties, but you know, as, as the zero ones guy, he, he, like you said, John, when he died, it was like, whoa, he's still a top guy in Japan. Mm -hmm. He's not the top guy, but in 2004, it's not really a, it was a different bar. You know, he was still Shinya Hashimoto. It's like, it, it'd be like if Keiji Muto died, then yeah. they were the same level, you know, or Misawa five years later. Sure. Or imagine if Misawa died uh, in 98 okay. before Babar's. It's it's almost like he, he was still, I mean, we're talking about him still. You know, he's he's a legend. And he really, he was a wrestler who brought, like, he was a very, very Japanese wrestler. He, he wrestled, and a lot of the New Japan wrestlers used martial arts as a way to legitimize themselves and legitimize what they were doing in the ring. And it also kind of, it's kind of like almost coded in a way you could say, because it's like, I'm going to use my national uh, kind of philosophy and my style is going to win. And I'm going to use, I'm going to go against you. It kind of starts at the 89 Tokyo Dome show style versus style, my Japanese strong style versus your uh, Greco Roman uh, amateur collegiate kickboxing, whatever. That was kind of what was going on all throughout the nineties, but that really defines Shin Hashimoto too, that way of thinking. So do you guys have any other thoughts on Mr. Hashimoto before we wrap up? Um, yeah, I'll go. Um, I, I think I mentioned last week that, Oh, we got some quotes gonna... coming from you. Excuse me. Whew. Yeah. I was, <laughs> was going to reach out to some people and, and, you know, so I reached out a couple guys and, um, through a friend of a friend, uh, through a friend who knows uh, Chris, you know, Steve Carino works with him actually. Um, Steve Carino sent a quote over about Shinya Hashimoto, and he said, In the ring, Shinya Hashimoto was a no nonsense warrior. Out of the ring, Hashimoto was a loyal and hilarious friend. He loved old school wrestling and loved mixing his strong style upbringing with a side of pro wrestling. He used to sit in his office. We used to sit in his office and talk about Stampede and Memphis angles and finishes. I miss him every day. And that was from uh, Steve Carino. Yeah, that's cool. 
It's right because Hashimoto worked in Memphis right after he became a uh, young lion, like 89, 88. Uh, I forget his name. He had a different name. I think it was something. Yeah, I, forget, con- I forget his name in, in Memphis, but I remember, I think I mentioned last week, I remember him, you know, he would Tojo Yamamoto, of course, and mm-hmm. them DDTing, uh, him DDTing Tracy's mother's head through the, the famous uh, Memphis table, you know, at, at the, on the studio there. Oh, it, so where like, uh, Dave yeah. Brown and Lance Brussel, uh, the Did side, uh, the side panel. Yeah. 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 So I never forget that. I mean, that was a wild at the time, you know, now we see it, you know, probably weekly, but it was, at the time it was a wild thing to see. Um, but yeah. And also I reached out to my, a good friend, old school, Oliver John, who um, did a tour in 2004 with zero one. Cause he was at UPW, which is uh, Rick Bassman's promotion down in California and he was training there and you know they so bastion sent some guys and um he was one of them and he says he says that shinny hashimoto he's like you know when he first saw him he's like just just this big guy in the locker room sitting there smoking a cigarette you know and he's and he's just like looked like uh like almost like a cartoon, like of like, like from the red, the rumble character, that guy, Oliver Platt's character. That's what, but then when he got in the ring with him, this is only his fifth match, Oliver John's fifth match. He got in the ring with them and out came the, you know, the music played and out came Hashimoto. And he said, he got so nervous in the goosebumps. You could feel the energy from that crowd when Hashimoto came out and how he controlled that crowd and how everyone was just like glued onto him. Like, he's like, Oh my God, I'm in, I'm in, I now here's the legend Hashimoto. Right. And then when he got in the ring with them, he's, you know, cause going to Japan, he, he heard like, Oh, you gotta be, you gotta be aggressive. You gotta be, you gotta be physical. You, cause they'll, they'll take it, you know, they'll take advantage of you, you know? And he gets that big chop from overhead chop from Hashimoto and it was so light, he forgot to sell it. <laughs> and, you know, he was like all you know, pent up and ready because he's just, you know, okay, I'm, they're going to get physical. It's going to be a physical match. And, you know, Hashimo was light as a feather with the kicks and everything and all that. And he said after the match was over, Hashimo came back up, came up to him with a cigarette in his hand. And he goes, Oliver, um, you, it was good, good. But, uh, Next time, lighter, lighter. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his memory of uh, working for Zero One, and uh, I think he did some stuff with Hustle too. But um, he said it was just a thrill just to be in the ring, because you know, with a legend like that and feeling that energy, of that crowd, like it really gave him the goosebumps. So, so he really got to thing. experience the uh, the essence, the legend, the almost yeah. or- Orson Welles sounds like. <laughs> um, you know, you want to hear an interesting fact that I found out over the years that in Japan, it's pretty common for a lot of wrestlers to smoke. Mm-hmm. It's pretty mind boggling. Misawa was a chain smoker. Actually, I heard a story that the, the Dragon Gate, I don't know if this is still true, but the Dragon Gate um, locker room, like, so everybody smokes. So there's actually like a smoking section, Not like there's own smoking locker room. Like that's how. That's how much it was. No, I, yeah, I, I know about I know about the smoke in Japan, but it's it's also funny that like Harley Race was like a chain smoker, right? And he's doing like yeah. 60, minute, sixty minute Broadways, like he was just a freak, right? So, Suzuki and, still smokes. Yeah, I know. I, I met him when I met him in New York uh, bef- uh, before Bloodsport, and after Bloodsport, he had a cigarette in his, in his mouth, and, and uh, it was a thrill hanging out with uh, Minoru Suzuki. It was a it was a trip, but. Uh, Really funny guy. Uh, it's ironic because that fight culture, wrestling, grappling, you know, any kakutogi, like combat sports. You know, in Japan, there's a lot of focus on training and conditioning and being the best, being in great shape. But no matter what, I feel like all these sports, as soon as practice is over, drinking beer is totally fine as much as you want. And, it, you know, if you smoke, if you happen to smoke, okay. That's fine. You know, it's, I don't think it's as frowned upon as it is here. It's kind of because I remember being a part of my jujitsu dojo. I mean, it, 
we would compete and everything, but we had fun too. So that's just part of it. So different kinds of uh, expectations all over. But um, yeah, it was interesting because Carino was a part of, so the quote from Carino, he was the uh, kind of feuding with Hashimoto a little bit early on with zero one. Yeah. With the and NWA he, world title. That's right. Yeah. NWA, yeah. both were NWA world champions yeah. at the King of old school, Steve Carino, who was just, mm -hmm. I, I loved Steve Carino in uh, late ECW. Yeah. Um, and he, he wrestled a lot where I kind of, my area, like Northeast area, his name was, he was being like WWE house shows, like a jobber guy. So that name was always there too. But, um, that's cool that that's really cool that they gave us those quotes. So thanks, Mr. Carino and Oliver John. Um, yeah. I don't know what else we got on Hashimoto other than, I mean, that's kind of, I hope that paints a picture of who he was and why he's important, why we think he's cool. Um, yeah. They, Any they, last, they, oh, yeah, go ahead, John. I was like, no, I, I think I just, you know, cause like we talked about last week, how cause of the breakup with new Japan was kind of bitter and had a bad taste. And like, other than the title hitch title history champion video, they don't really talk about him anymore. You know, more. He's not as he's not, of course, you know, they can't bring him back cause he's passed away, but you know, like, Chono is brought back and they talk about Chono and, and, you know, of course, you know, Muda still, people still talk about him and just, you know, maybe cause it's a long time ago when he passed away. It just, I think people forgot how great Shinya Hashimoto was. And it's nice that we get opportunity to kind of remind the fans that, you know, if they haven't even seen him before, like check him out. I think they'll really be, I think it will become a fan of his. If you've never seen his work in the ring, you will quickly become a fan of Shinya Hashimoto and he'll be one of your favorites. Yeah. And I think when he passed, I don't think he had squashed a lot of uh, things in his life that were, you know, still, I don't think he was okay. That's what happens in life. You know, th things weren't completely copacetic. Mm -hmm. So, and he, unfortunately he passed before he could, you know, stitch things up completely. And actually he was, the plan was he was coming back to new Japan before he passed. There was like a, a deal in place, but it's it's a shame we won't know because you know Muto and Chono, they're still we see them all the time because they're still huge celebrities in Japan. I mean they're they're really the Hogans and the Rocks of Japan. They they can do anything they want. Chono is in he's in McDonald's commercials. He's he's <laughs> like awesome. he can those guys. It's they kind of transcend. You know, like the Rock can go and do whatever the hell he wants. He really can. And in Japan, Chono and, and Muto do that too. And Hashimoto would ju he would be right there, he yeah. uh, because it was those three. And they still pay tribute to him sometimes. I remember uh, well, there was one show where uh, it was one of those New Japan uh, Tokyo Dome match uh, Tokyo Dome's from like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and the main event was like six man tag kind of nostalgia ish match. And Chono and Muto after the match ended, they. They wore the Hachimaki kind of headband that he used to wear, and they did a little tribute to him in the ring. But yeah, like you said, John, it's not much more than that. It seems like that uh, part of history is unfortunately just kind of not not forgotten about. But at least on the English side, it's easier to forget about because look how much more stuff has happened over twenty years. It's easy to forget, yeah, uh, and especially because like his son wrestles Daichi Hashimoto. I've seen him wrestle countless times i don't think i think he gets a lot of um he gets a lot of shit even though i don't think he deserves all of that he i think it was big japan's heavyweight champion recently at least within the past year yeah so that's just because not as good as his dad type of deal or just because of who his dad is type of deal oh i'm not sure exactly why this is between like um between what you see on uh, English Twitter about just p people just or listening on podcasts, uh, pundits like us, uh, some people are not into him. I don't know. He doesn't wrestle like his father. He, he's good, but he's different. He's very young. I think he had his first, ma first match when he was 14 for Inoki's IGF deal. But um, And in Japan, it always kind of seemed like to me, it's like you're the son of like a big superstar, so you got to start from zero and, and earn your way. You gotta you gotta really work your way up the ladder. That whole kind of psychology, I guess you could say, that is a big part of like understanding like every match you watch on a New Japan card. Like like Okan, he lost, but it's like so normal to lose. And 
And if you're somebody like Hashimoto who kind of born into it, I remember watching him at uh, big Japan shows at Korokun Hall. And there's this little like, four or five person, like older dudes group. They're probably in their fifties and they go to every single big Japan show at Korokun. And they're always in the top corner, uh, like above the, like the standing area. And they just laid into him like crazy. Like, I don't know why people say J- Japanese crowds are quiet because these guys he was in a tag match against, uh, you guys remember Tatsuhito Takaiwa? He's a 0-1 New Japan junior heavyweight. He was in there and he was just laying into them. And they were just, yeah, lay, yeah. Just, they wanted Takaiwa to beat the living hell out of Hashimoto so badly. <laughs> so badly. They were so like enthusiastic. They were just like, to kill him, kill him. Um, I don't know why. So people don't like him for certain reasons, but it kind of speaks to that. Like Hashimoto was also like polarizing in a way. He he didn't have like a squeaky clean PR record. Um, he was he was who he was, uh, and that really came through in a lot of his matches. I mean, his charisma. It's it's like what we were talking about with about Osprey earlier. Compare Osprey to Hashimoto's like, just uh, personality or like what you see in the ring, just without the the moves. Just the the being, like you can't compare them. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any uh, specific matches you guys would want to maybe recommend, or was some of your favorites of his? JD, do you have any? Like, I, I like the talk. I like the Takata match that we because we were on that. We were talking about that last week, so that was oh, the yeah. first thing I went and checked out. I loved it. I loved the little backslide kick that he hits on Takata and the crowd just loses their freaking mind when it happens. Like it just, it was awesome. I really enjoyed that match. I liked it actually more than the Mudo matches, which I quite enjoyed too. Yeah. I like, I like, I like that match better than the Mudo match as well. And I think it's a good starting point for him too. And, and then if you like more of his stuff, I mean, you can go watch his older stuff too after that, or you can kind of watch that legend. Sean, you still there? I was going to say, is this me? Did I lose it? Uh, it looks like... Uh, John, we don't hear you. We'll hang out. He'll come back. But, I'm um, here. Oh, there here we go. go. I, 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 the first time it caught me, before it was like... <laughs> before I, I it happened, and I just... You guys are still talking, so I get back on. <laughs> but... Um, no, but Hashimoto yeah. and... Um, uh, Takata. Yeah, I, I agree. It was uh it was better to me than the Muto matches, although the Muto matches were the money making matches. Yeah, yeah. So um any any other uh kind of favorite moments uh, from Hashimoto from you, John? <sighs> God, to me that that was that that match there, the Takata Hashimoto match. I just like I think it's just a it's just a beautiful match. And I can't explain. I think I talked about last week as well, like the the finish, the brain buster, how yeah. just majestic. I mean, I yeah, I can't like it's like it's not slow motion, but it was it feels like slow motion, and he holds him up, and people are like just just rising with the brain buster, and he and you know Takata's holding his legs not straight like a wrestler, like a trained wrestler would. You know, he is trained. But like I said, the eight legs are kind of split open a little bit. It just looks out of control, but in control. And he comes crashing down with the brain buster, and the crowd knows it's over. I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's poetry. Like you were saying with the Oliver John quote earlier, it was kind of like it looked so like that's how you would imagine a, a real brain buster would look if somebody deadlifted a person in the air. Mm-hmm. That's how it would look. But like we were talking about, it's the art of it, the technique. It's he's it ends up being like that because of how he wrestles. He chose to wrestle yeah. that way. So, um, yeah, he's special. And okay. So John, and so if we can like understand him today in 2021, right. How is he different from Will Ospreay? <laughs> how is he different? Yeah. To kind of understand him in a more modern context because i it's we can't we can't talk about like wrestling moves it's more about like the The persona persona and hashimoto like how we like when you think about hashimoto it's like it's more of a personality driven Mm -hmm. like like his do you do you happen to watch his match in night i think it was night g1 match with tenu 
where they just went, they went nuts on each other. Just, and the crowd was rabid, rabid. I'm t- again with the quiet crowds, like go watch the G1 1998 Tenryu, Genshiro Tenryu, and Shinya Hashimoto match. This is not quiet. This is the opposite of that. Well, he just, he was all business from the curtain to the ring. And he stared him up. He stared a hole through you, his opponents. He was he was intense, and I mean that's that's why I think of him. That's why he's. A, I mean, the 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 te- the just the emotion before the match even starts for a blow is even thrown or a, a lockup. You just feel the tension between like he. Oh my God, he's gonna go out there and try to murder this guy, whoever he's wrestling, and he is just. That's what I loved about him. He was all business. And yeah, he didn't look like Lex Luger or an Ultimate Warrior, but he didn't need to. And you still believe he was a badass, you know? So he had a little extra pounds on him. So what? He could still fire a big roundhouse, jumping roundhouse kick. And, you know, and he could fire up the best of the best fire, you know, fire ups ever. And he's just, he's amazing. And, you know, shoot, I'll take it off. I'll take a Shinya Hashimoto, his worst match against Osprey's best match, honestly. Ooh. You know, I just because he's, you know, the, he, I believe he made me believe, you know, Osprey doesn't make me believe. Osprey makes me clap like a, like a great performance. Like, oh, good job. You know, it was great, great. Thank you. But like Hashimoto got me into like, oh man, yeah, this is, this feels like a fight where, you know, he's, he, he, that's why I miss about pro wrestling is like, I, I used to miss that, those guys that could really make you suspend, suspend disbelief. And, you know, he did that. Let's end it right there. I can't put it any more perfectly. That's why you're here, Mr. LaRocca. Thank you. That's a great quote. Because I, I mean, I, we'll talk about it more in the future, but like, if a match is like a, a performance style match, in some ways, it, it's not necessarily bad. So even though Osprey is like, I agree that he's doing his, the way he wrestles and the way a lot of people wrestle these days, it's they're wrestling a, they got a plan and they're going to stick to the plan and they're going to execute the plan like a play or like um, a song. I don't know. It's, it's just a different style, but although I, I tend to kind of lean towards what you're feeling, you you can't match someone's intensity like that because it comes from a real place somehow. And Hashimoto, he embodied very easily what kind of looked like to be like a warrior. Yes. A fighter. So Check out Shinya Hashimoto when you can. All right, people. All right. Wow. We went which longer than I thought, but it's for you, patrons. Enjoy. And I'll be back soon with, uh, oh, this will come out on Wednesday, but so I shouldn't even talk about it. But, you know, if you want to recap, I'll, uh, there's some solo recaps that I did on the Patreon. So check those out. If you have questions, uh, email me at justin at fightgamemedia.com. If you have any, patreon related kind of issues please go and email support at fightgamemedia.com all right now it's time to watch wrestle kingdom 15 you guys ready or i mean going to bed is acceptable as well i know jd you're up late right now it's 1 30 <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> sorry, sorry jd it's all, no, it's all good man. sorry I jd this. i love i love being here this is the best but I'm starting to fall asleep on my computer. <laughs> All right. Get, get some sleep. Get some sleep. I'm going to watch some wrestling and podcast some more. And from us, JD and John and myself, this is High Tension. And we'll see you next week.